lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Wow, I am so honored to all of you who are sharing the podcast on social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. I can see it in the show growth, and that's how podcasts grow, primarily through word of mouth. So thank you to everyone who is sharing the show with their friends and family, especially their gardening friends and their family members who like to garden. If you're new here, I'm Jennifer Ebling, and this podcast is dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. This podcast gives me a chance to talk to all kinds of gardeners all over the world, both in terms of the guests that I have on the show and the listeners of the podcast that are in the listener community. And if you're not yet part of the listener community, it's a growing private Facebook group that's filled with gardeners who have an innate curiosity about gardening and a passion to learn more. It's a space not only for listeners of the show, but also guests of the show. And when I created the group, that's exactly what I envisioned. Easy access for listeners to interact with the guests that have been on the podcast to help inform and inspire you so that you can continue the conversation and ask questions that the episode might have triggered in your mind or simply to say thank you for the content, for the great information. So please come join us for free just by going to Facebook and then in the search bar type still growing podcast group and the group will pop right up. And then all you have to do is request to join. I'll see your request and I'll admit you into the group. So guests that are currently members of the group right now include Tara Nolan, the author of Raised Bed Revolution, Anna Thomas, the author of Vegan Vegetarian Omnivore, Marta McDowell, the author of All the President's Gardens, Megan Kane, the fantastic author of so many vegetable and planning books on gardening, and she also blogs at creativevegetablegardener.com. And also Benedict Van Heems of The Big Bug Hunt, which is this episode that I featured last fall about a fantastic reporting and prediction service to help with pest control. So go ahead and check it out. The next time you're in Facebook, just search for Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to see you in the group. Now, I want to make sure that I welcome new members to the group this week. And new members this week include Sean Matthews, Roy Becker, Shannon Palma, Tessa Lawrence, Tammy Cooper, Lisa Mudge, Marketa Havlick, Melinda Distasi, Becky Smith, and Lori Kosick. So welcome, you guys. You know, the group, the Facebook group, the listener community is also the only place I go to pick winners of the giveaways from my guests and sponsors. And this week, the winners of the two books that were offered by Megan Kane, last week's guest. Megan is the blogger at creativevegetablegardener.com. She was giving away two fantastic books. The first one is the book that we covered in detail in last week's episode, and it's called Super Easy Food Preserving. And the winner is Sherry Kump. And then the other book that Megan was so generous to give away is her brand new book. It's her Smart Start Garden Planner. And the winner is Susan Scholler McKenna. So congratulations, Sherry and Susan. Go ahead and private message me your contact information, your email and your address. And I'll make sure to get your information to Megan and she will be thrilled to send you those books. That's fantastic. You know, last week, I announced that I'm starting a listener advisory board that's made up of a group of volunteers from the Facebook group. So I was looking for about four to six folks to be on this board. I have space for one more. And the whole point of participating in the listener advisory board is to give me feedback and to give me guidance because I really want the show to be very listener directed. So I put a post in the group 
outlining the terms and conditions. And board members will serve for spans of four months. So this first group, this charter group, will serve between February and May of 2017. And we will do a weekly video chat where we will talk about all kinds of things related to the podcast, including the guest funnel, so the upcoming guests that are going to be on the show, building listenership, how we're marketing the show in social media, and the video chats are recorded so that if anybody who wants to help out in the lab can't attend a meeting, they can always watch a recorded video and then offer their input at a later time when it's convenient for them. This is a completely volunteer opportunity, and the commitment will take definitely no more than an hour a week, including the video chat. And lab members automatically receive a membership into the March and May Still Growing Book Club. And of course, I'll recognize them at the end of every episode. So if you'd like to get in the lab, the listener advisory board for the podcast, go ahead and join that Facebook group. And then in the discussion, just indicate that you're interested in participating as a lab member. Your input is so valuable to me, and you can definitely help steer the direction of the show moving forward. So thanks in advance for that. You know, at the end of last week's episode, I mentioned that I had talked on the phone with my mom and she had reminded me that daylight savings time is coming up. And I wanted to make sure to mention it at the beginning of this show because it's early this year. It's Sunday, March 12th, and that is just around the corner. And by the time this show airs, it's less than a month away. So we are going to be back in our gardens before you know it. Well, if you're new to the show, I always start out with a Garden News Roundup before I go to the guest interview. The Garden News Roundup always starts out with an update from a past guest. This week, I'm featuring a very fun post by Beth Stettenfield of the blog Plant Postings. Now, Beth is a garden blogger in southern Wisconsin, and this fantastic post that she wrote was called, It's Only a Rock Wall, or Is It? And she did a great job going out into her garden in Wisconsin in January and taking pictures of her rock wall, which is covered in all kinds of amazing living things including a variety of mosses and lichen and all kinds of little crevices and structures, along with plant material that's continuing to grow despite the cold and the snow. So she has these fabulous pictures, these wonderful images, including how the warmth of the rock is encouraging her sedums to sprout early. I just loved this post, and Beth ended it by saying, some of these spots actually look warm and comfortable. I guess the rock wall is more than simply a pile of cold, hard rock. It's a vibrant, active ecosystem. And readers of her blog agree. There's a ton of comments on this post in her blog, and I absolutely loved it. So thank you, Beth, for sharing that. And if you want to follow Beth's blog, just look for plantpostings.blogspot.com. In the sustainability category, I found these wonderful posts that were all about urban farming. The first one was showing how in Africa, urban farming is producing more than just food. It's producing social networks that are an important spinoff. And the setting for this particular post was Cape Town, South Africa. Now, this post was featured in theconversation.com. And there was a little paragraph that I thought summed it up nicely. And it says, Our research shows that building social networks is one of the greatest benefits of urban agriculture in poor areas. This research was conducted on Cape Flats, a vast residential area of mainly low-cost council housing and shacks. I found this article to be completely fascinating. And then the second article I found about urban farming was featured on urbanorganicgardener.com. And this was all about the urban farm in LA that focuses on microgreens, such as arugula, cilantro, or daikon radish. And then the final article was written by Michigan State University Extension, and it just validates that urban agriculture as a trend is continuing to be very strong in 2017. 
From a continuing ed standpoint, there was a wonderful post that was written actually back in 2013 by Aaliyah Milham, and it was featured on premeditatedleftovers.com. How's that for a fantastic blog title, premeditatedleftovers.com. And this post is all about how to make your own rabbit repellent. So if you're someone who loves to do that DIY when it comes to pest control, this would be a great option for you. And then also, in the continuing ed DIY segment, there was a really wonderful YouTube video that I stumbled on, and it reminded me so much of my recent conversation with Pam Pennick, the author of The Water Saving Garden. So I forwarded the YouTube video to Pam, and then I also shared it in the Facebook group. And the video was by Toby Hemenway, and it's called Contouring Soil to hold water. It's fantastic. And it's a great follow up to that episode that I did with Pam a couple of weeks ago in episode 555, where we talked about Pam's book, The Water Saving Garden. In the how-to segment, I shared two posts. One was on how to prune your fruit trees now for a summer bumper crop. This was a great article that was featured in the Dallas News. This post was written by Ann McCormick. It's very concise, and it walks you through step-by-step Pruning 101 Basics. It's a great article to read this time of year. And then there's a wonderful post on African violets. This was featured in A Garden for the House, and the author shares their tips on how to achieve constant bloom with your African violets. This is an extremely thorough post, and if you are a lover of African violets, you would enjoy reading this post. And again, all of the articles that I share in the Garden News Roundup are posted during the week in the Facebook group. So no need to take notes, just head over to the Facebook group, and all of the great content is just delivered right there. In the plant spotlight this week, there were two things that caught my attention. The first one is this little tiny banana that grows on the Musa tiny banana tree. And the banana is so little, it's about the size of a thumb. It is just the cutest little thing, and it totally caught my attention. So when I shared it in the group, much to my shock, I actually had a listener reply back and tell me that they had this tree growing in a container in their house in Minnesota. I was totally blown away. And then also making the plant spotlight this week are Texas blue bonnets. The 2017 Texas blue bonnets have bloomed, and it's thrilling to see them on Texas roadsides. This was reported by Big Bend National Park on TexasHillCountry.com, and they announced early in February that the blue bonnets have begun sprouting along trails and roadsides. Texas blue bonnets usually bloom between February and April. Well, in the news this week are three very interesting stories. The first was shared in the LA Times, and the headline is How This Garlic Farm Went From a Labor Shortage to Over 150 People on Its Applicant Wait List. And this story is all about how the biggest fresh garlic producer in the nation, Christopher Ranch, which grows garlic on 5,000 acres in Gilroy, California, announced recently that it would hike pay for farm workers from $11 an hour to $13 an hour this year, or 18% for an increase, and then $15 an hour in 2018. That's four years earlier than what's required by California's schedule for minimum wage increases. And the vice president of this company is quoted in this article saying that the effect of that move was immediately obvious because at the end of last year, the farm was short 50 workers needed to help peel, package, and roast garlic. And within two weeks of upping wages in January of this year, applications flooded in. And now the company has a wait list 150 people long. Company representatives say they had no idea that it would solve their labor problem. So they're very happy with this result. And then there were a number of news outlets reporting on this fossil that was found in South America. And it was a fossil of a tomatillo. And the fact that these fossil remains of tomatillos were found in Patagonia, Argentina, proves that nightshades evolved earlier than thought. 
In fact, the article is saying that potatoes, peppers, tobacco, petunias, and tomatoes are now shown to have existed 52 million years ago, long before the dates previously ascribed to these species. And then I stumbled on this next news story in a very circuitous way. My friend and fellow garden blogger, Marianne Newcomer, shared a press release from Far West Landscape and Garden Center in Boise, Idaho. And it was all about their policy on you plants. And essentially, the garden center was offering anyone who had a you plant and decided they didn't want it a $30 voucher toward a replacement shrub. This caught my attention, and so I started to research this story, which was apparently breaking all over Boise, Idaho in early February. And there was an article that was posted in the Idaho Statesman on February 7th of this year, and the headline is, Popular Landscaping Bush Has Killed Dozens of Big Game Animals in the Treasure Valley. And it's kind of a spooky article because it starts out by sharing this story of a homeowner and a conservation officer who watch a mule deer eat from a poisonous yew bush in this homeowner's backyard last Friday. And then they follow the deer as it runs over a hill. And then the homeowner says, it was dead. They die that fast. It was not 10 minutes and that deer was dead. So the homeowner, Jerry Smith, and his wife, Donna, have lived in their house in the Barber Valley for 46 years. And they learned in January that the three yew bushes that they planted in their front yard were poisonous. So now this homeowner and his wife have covered those plants with shrink wrap, and they're going to rip them out this spring. And I thought these statistics were absolutely staggering. This article reports that yew poisoning has been cited as the cause of death for at least 28 elk, 50 pronghorn, and an unknown number of deer this winter. As wild animals filter into populated areas in search of food that's not covered with snow. Now, apparently, the toxicity of yews, Y-E-W, is no secret. In fact, more than 2,000 years ago, Julius Caesar wrote about a king committing suicide by yew in his book about the Gaelic Wars. In this article, Mark Drew, a wildlife veterinarian for Idaho Fish and Game, had examined some of these animals. And he said that while many poisonous substances are distasteful enough to discourage consumption, the animals that he examined were full of you. And he says that even if the animals limit themselves to just a few bites, you could kill them. Studies show that it takes 30 grams of leaves to kill a dog and about 500 grams to kill cattle. So he says you're talking about a half a cup or a cupful for big game, so not much. In fact, they die pretty quickly because their heart stops. And he's quoted in the article saying, some of these animals die with yew leaves in their mouth and esophagus still. So they don't even get it completely ingested, and it's that toxic. And just to bring this story full circle, I thought Marianne's comment about the actions of Far West Landscape and Garden Center really were right on the mark. Because remember, this is a garden center that because they are concerned about this issue, just completely on their own are willing to give customers $30 in exchange for bringing in any you plant to help mitigate this problem. So Marianne had written that it's one of the most gracious and thoughtful actions ever by a nursery, and I agree. Now, in my dream guest segment this week is an artist that looks at plant roots and studies how they form these very intricate geometric shapes and patterns. And this is all done by an artist named Diana Scherer, and she's Amsterdam-based, and she's German, and she explores how the sensitive roots of plants, sometimes referred to as the brains of the plant, can be molded and shaped into intricate man-made forms. This article has so many beautiful images because Cher works with roots and she cultivates them in soil around custom-made subterranean molds and then she unearths them at a later time to reveal a thick, 
ordered mesh that almost feels like a fabric, like a textile. And then if you zoom in, you can see how these organic elements weave and interlace themselves to create even more complex forms. It's really art. It's amazing to see. So this post I absolutely loved. And assuming that the artist can speak English and would be willing to do an interview, Diana Scherer is definitely a dream guest I would love to have on the show. In the science segment this week, there were two fun posts that caught my eye. The first was by Joe Hansen, a PhD biologist based in Austin, Texas. And this is from the blog, It's Okay to Be Smart. And he talks about in this article, the chemical structure of geosmin, which is the compound behind the smell of the earth after rain. This is a fun little article about where that smell originates from and how that smell cannot be replicated anywhere other than when it rains. In fact, we are so sensitive to that smell that you could put one drop of that chemical in an Olympic-sized swimming pool and we would still smell the geosmin. And then there was this really cool article that was featured in LiveScience.com, and it's called Are Trees Vegetarian? And Nicholas Money, a professor of botany at Miami University in Ohio, says the short answer is no. Plants are not vegetarian, but the devil is always in the details. And those details depend on how strictly vegetarianism is defined. Trees don't directly eat animals, but they do consume them with the help of fungi. The fungal network produces enzymes that can break down fats and proteins from dead organisms that live in the soil. And the fungi and the trees have a perfect symbiotic relationship. In fact, the relationship has its own name, mycorrhiza, which is Greek for fungus root. So trees consume animal components through this mycorrhizal relationship. Isn't that fascinating? In the shopping segment this week... There is a super useful post that I found on Pinterest, and it's simply called 20 Money-Saving Gardening Tips. I won't go through them here, but I did share them in the Facebook group, and there might be a few in there that can help you this year when you're shopping for your garden. And finally, in the inspiration segment, there's an article from homify.com, and it's called The Do's and Don'ts, The Garden Edition. I thought this article would be particularly inspiring to you because it shares some of the garden ideas that are worth investing in and then garden ideas that you should probably forget about, either because they're too expensive or they're too hard to maintain. In any case, the article does a great job of offering solutions for almost any idea that you're thinking about doing in your backyard this summer. Well, that's it for the Garden News Roundup. Again, just a reminder, you can find all of the information that I just shared in the Facebook group. These are just a handful of the posts that made it into the group this week. And again, I work very hard to curate information for my listener community. And it's one of the ways that I can stay in touch with you and continue to help you grow and learn as a gardener in between episodes. So go ahead, check out the listener community the next time you're in Facebook. Just go up to the search bar and type in Still Growing Podcast Group and request to join. I'd love to see you in the group. Well, today's guest is Nell Foster. She blogs at Joyous Garden, and the tagline is Garden, Create, Make the World a More Beautiful Place. Nell's blog is where she celebrates all things garden, and she shares her passion for plants, flowers, and the great outdoors, and she loves to create. She recently packed her bags, hitched the wagon train, and moved to Tucson, Arizona after living by the ocean in California for 30 years. Nell has a wonderful YouTube channel full of gardening 101 and horticultural how-tos. She just posted six days ago this fantastic video on how to prune overgrown bougainvilleas. It's entertaining. It's got great tips. And I just love Nell's videos. Now, Nell and I spoke last summer. In fact, it was the middle of July. It was right before my daughter's birthday. And Nell was still getting settled into her fabulous new place in Tucson, Arizona, after moving from Santa Barbara, California. We talk all about her multi-decade career in horticulture, of course, her big move to the Southwest, and finding joy 
in the garden. Well, hello, Nell. I am so glad that I get a chance to talk to you today. Jennifer, it's a real treat. It's a real treat to be talking to you from the West. Yes, from the West. Exactly. Well, I was excited to interview you because I stumbled on your blog about a month ago. And first of all, I have to say that, yes, and I love the name of your blog, Joyous Garden. And why don't we start by having you share a little bit about your website and how it came to be, how you named it. And then we'll jump into some of the things that you and I both have in common, the gardening, the creativity, blogging, photography, and so on. Great. Well, I was a professional gardener in the San Francisco Bay Area for years. I designed gardens, and I maintained them, and I did flower shows. I studied horticulture, and I studied landscape design, so I've been in the field for a long time. And when I sold that business and I moved to uh, Santa Barbara, I wanted to actually start a different type of business, but I wasn't sure what I was going to do. But I also had, at the same time, I owned a commercial Christmas decorating business, which is kind of odd. So I chose the name Joyous because I was going to do little decorated, fully decorated trees and and garden themes and natural themes and all that. And then I decided that the two to three foot trees take just as long to make as the big trees. So I switched into um, the gardening accessories line. I don't know if you saw that I do a line of garden bags and aprons and tool bags. No. Yes. Oh, yeah. You can see it under our shop tab. Uh, under our shop tab, it says gardening accessories. Okay. And then through that, you know, we just go through it. evolutions with business. I thought, well, I, I don't want to do this full time because this isn't quite quite creative enough. There's only so many garden bags and garden aprons you can do because people don't buy a new garden apron every season. So then I thought, why don't I start a blog? I started a blog as as support to the gardening accessories, and then as time went on, I discovered I really liked that, and then I, I started a YouTube channel, and I did my first YouTube video at, at either 55 or 56, which is ancient in, in YouTube world, you know. <laughs> I'm like the, I'm like the, the, the great-grandmother. So I started that, and I just, I, I just really discovered that I really enjoyed sharing what I know, and so... The the name of the business was Joyous because it was Christmas. It was a Christmas theme, but then it was a little vague. So when I switched into the gardening, I added the garden on the end. I see. So that's how it all came about, and I discovered that I really like YouTube. I like doing videos. I think it's a great way to teach people rather than just reading a blog to actually see what you're doing. Because I interact with a lot of very beginning gardeners and that's great because everybody starts somewhere that's exactly right now do you do all your own photography um i do most of my own photography yes wow because i do some... my photography unless unless there happens to be somebody filming me i film myself a lot the person i work with she lives um someplace else so we work via skype okay so i pretty much film myself i will sometimes have somebody with me Okay. But I do I do a lot of my own. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much that you have done. In 18 years hands-on experience in the field, you can't beat it, can you? No, and I'm still, I just got back from the San Francisco Bay area. I was up there for like five days doing an intensive pruning job for an ex-client out there. So I still keep my hands, I mean, I still keep my hands in, in the actual gardening part of things, too. So I... Yeah. I enjoy that. I enjoy pruning. Uh, I love to prune. I love to plant. So, Well, I love to hear you say yes. that, too, because pruning is really a skill. You get better at it, it as you do it. A lot of people are deathly afraid of pruning. What tips do you have for people to get out there and prune? Well, you do have to prune, especially there's plants need pruning. It's like our hair needs to be cut. It really does need to be cut to stay healthy and plants do, and there's different types of pruning. There's pruning for aesthetics. There's pruning to bring back the health of a plant. There's pruning to control. So I would say the best advice I could give to a beginning beginning gardener is really know how the plant grows and how it's going to respond to the pruning. I, I remember the first time I pruned a salvia gregii, and I, you know, it was an older one that was woody and steady, and I pruned it almost all the way back. It's it just did not recover. <laughs> it did not. So, no. 
No, I think it's just good to know how the plant grows and how the plant is going to grow back. Like, for instance, I was saying I I worked in the Bay Area for years, and there's a lot of, you know, because the, the temperature is almost always the same up there. You've got to thin out a lot of the plants to control insect and disease, and that's always good to know because the air circulation in, the, in a plant is good. Yes. And sometimes you just want to prune a plant because you want it to look better. Yes. So I would say know your plants. <laughs> Pay attention out there. When you think about pruning, is there a particular pruner you like? Do you like the little bitty pruner? Are you more of a clipper oh, kind of gal? What kind of pruning I tools do you like? I am a Felco. I am a Felco number two girl. I had my pair of Felcos for probably over 50, over 50 years, the same pair. Wow. I used to I used to have five pair, but three disappeared over the years. But now I have two. But I use my Felcos. And I also use the Fisker's. Floral nips for deadheading, okay. you know, smaller, finer things. Hmm. So those are my two probably favorite things, but I am a diehard Felco number two fan. Well, there you go. And I, it's, it, it's just amazing because I have pruned a lot, believe me, and I haven't had to replace a part on them because all the parts are, re- are replaceable on them and they're, they're great pruners. Okay. Now, one of the first things I saw when I stopped by your website is Mm -hmm. this picture I'm sure you cherish. And I know that you've talked about this quite a bit before, but it's this fantastic photo, um, this black and white kind of grainy photo of your dad (laughs) holding you as a two-month-old baby on the family tractor. You grew up on a farm. What was that like for you? I did. Well, it was a great experience. Um, I always say that I'm glad that I survived my childhood because I'm perched up there on on the top of that steering wheel and my dad had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth because a lot of people smoked at that day and he also had a bottle of beer. So (laughs) I'm still alive. (laughs) But but I grew up in Litchfield County, Connecticut, and it was a beautiful place to grow up. And this was a while ago, so we didn't have the internet to really know what was going on in other parts of the world. So, this, so that was our world. I mean, ki- and kids now can see everything. You, yes. know, you can see what's going on in different parts and this and that. So it was pretty much, um, it was great. We had a lot of land. We had like 40 acres and we had woods and a pond and a pool. And my dad always did like a huge vegetable garden that was like probably 25 feet by 40 feet. Oh, wow. So grew a lot of our own food, which meant canning and preserving also. And we just ran wild and free. It was back when you didn't have to worry about that, too. That's right. And we did chores. We did a lot of chores, too. <laughs> which, <laughs> build, chores. which also builds character. It does. It does. At the time, you're like... Yeah, but I love the animals, and I love the plants, and my dad built a greenhouse, too, so we had a greenhouse. He was really into plants and starting everything from seed, too, so. Yeah, you were getting an mm-hmm. education. You just didn't realize that, I was, that you I were. was, because that's, because that's the best way to learn. As you know, you can go to school, college, and learn all this stuff, but the hands-on is the best. Well, your childhood sounds pretty cool, and I know you said that your dad built this greenhouse off of your dining room, and he also turned one of his barns into a workshop where he was kind of using his own creativity, but he encouraged you to do that as well. Do you remember Mm -hmm. your childhood as a magical time? I do, and I think that's why I am creative. Now, I mean, I'm not saying I'm any like wonderful, you know, fabulous creative person, but I have a lot of creativity because I did grow up out in the middle of nowhere. We didn't have the distractions like people have now, the computers and the iPads, and my dad had a workshop in one of the barns because he was a contractor, carpenter also, and I would spend a lot of time in there with the work tables, and I was always encouraged to be creative and to make things and to grow things, so it really encouraged a lot of creativity because that's just how I grew up. And that's carried forward into your adult life as well. And is that... Exactly. Yeah, is that something that energizes you, spending time creating? Oh, I love to. I love to plant, too. I love to be... I I say that I love glitter as much as I love dirt. (laughs) (laughs) But I love um, love both of them. And having had a Christmas decorating business, that really satisfied a lot of my creativity. And and as I said, we did big flower shows, too. I did the Macy's 
flower, flower shows for years and the Marshall Fields flower shows. So. Oh, you did? Mm-hmm. I did them for years and years. So it's 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 something I still do. I still love to create and I love to make things. And I love to pretty much on my website and my YouTube channel, I make things using plants and flowers. I try to use things from nature, you know? Yes. For that. So. Well, it's so fun to hear you say the Macy's Flower Show because I went to the, the flower show here in Minneapolis at that Macy's. Oh, exactly. That's yeah. Right. That's and right. yeah. There. And I got a behind the scenes tour with one of the guys that helped put it together. And that okay. is very interesting to see behind kind of the sets mm-hmm. um, and how they've jury rigged some of these plants so that they were, you know, in the right position. They actually had a. Uncle Foggy hanging, like kind of suspended from the top of this piece of wood so that it looked like it was coming down over the mountaintop. And um, he's like, I got to show you this. You're never going to believe how this thing is up here. But um, there is a lot of artistry and creativity and almost like home improvement that goes into those shows. There's a lot, especially the Mar- when we were doing the Marshall Fields show, because that's a, that was well, Marshall Fields is in Macy's now, but yes. it was it's a big store and it had a lot of windows. So we did the windows all the way around. We did the water tower store and used to bring like eight semi trucks full of plants from California to do it. And it was just back in the back back in the heyday of of retail. It was just beautiful and working with all those plants. But as I say, you sort of lose your creativity at 5 a.m. You're like, okay, I'm ready to go home and take a bath. (laughs) I'm ready ready to go back to the hotel and take a bath. I'm like seeing tulips. (laughs) Yes, that's right. That's all you see. Yep. There was an engineering crew who worked with us, too, because there was a lot of that that had to be done. So you don't see that. You don't see that when you go to the show. You just see all these beautiful plants, but you've got to see that behind the scenes. And it's a lot of work. It's also a lot of work to upkeep it. You know, that was stunning to me because they they were saying how they're, the beds along the edges, they would fully replace every two weeks because people sit down, they change diapers there, they do all kinds of crazy oh, yeah. things right around the perimeter. And they <clears throat> said, you would not believe the number of people that actually step into those gardens and do all kinds of crazy mm-hmm. things. You know, they're taking pictures or they're having their pictures taken. Yep. It wouldn't even occur to me to go off the path, but apparently people do. People do that they do and do doing the windows as you know, because we would do the interior store, but doing the windows, it was, you know, the show was like, it was the end of March into April. It could be very cold and then it could be very, you know, when the sun comes through the windows, it can be very hot. So you had to find that. It was like maintaining a garden because you had to find that fine line between not drowning the plants too, because you didn't want to be replacing too much. It definitely, Interesting, but it was always fun because it was at a time when everything was still deciduous and dormant back there. And, you know, there were a lot of plants that people did did not know because they all came from California. So it was always fun to do. Horticulture over the span of your lifetime has taken you from the East Coast to the West and then back and forth. And, of course, as you mentioned, you're you're from uh, Litchfield, Connecticut. Is Santa Barbara the perfect place for you as a gardener? Well, Santa Barbara was a great place to garden, but I've moved on. I don't live in Santa Barbara anymore. Oh, you don't? <laughs> I just moved. I moved to Arizona. I, I live in the desert. You live in the desert now. <laughs> but Santa Barbara was a great place to garden. I learned so much there and so much grew because of the climate. It was a warmer than San Francisco by the sea. It was like the ideal climate for fleshy succulents and so many plants grew there it was like a joy to garden and I also did a post about leaving a garden you love behind leaving a garden you love wow was that hard for you it was hard because you know that's the thing about a garden you know you are a gardener you plant a garden and it has to grow it's not like you put a sofa and a chair in your living room and they're going to stay as they are but a garden grows in. So when it finally grows in and does its thing, um, it was hard to leave, but I was very excited about moving someplace totally new and creating a new garden. Where are you at in Arizona? I'm in Tucson, Arizona. You You can see my garden. It's a smaller garden, which I like. 
so I can garden when I want to. It's very green, actually. The Sonoran Desert gets summer rain, too, so it's greener than you would think the desert would be. And I have plans for my garden. I'm also going to do a post and a video very soon about planning a garden because I want to share my thoughts with people if, if, if anyone is, like, planning a garden because I think it is harder to plan a small garden than a big garden, especially when you're a plant person. Well, <laughs> you have to really choose your plants. It's like, I want them all. <laughs> yes. Well, and the reality is so many people have small spaces to deal with. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. There they are. So I've got some nice big established plants here, and then I have some space to play with. I'm going to be doing a lot of container gardening. I'm going to be growing some of my own food now. So I'm, I'm going to be doing some new things because I think it's good to, I think it's good to keep things fresh on your, on your YouTube channel and your blog too. Absolutely. Now, Arizona, I was a piano mm-hmm. teacher for about 15 years. And during that, oh, really? ta- yeah, during that time, I had okay. a gentleman who put a humidifier in my piano because it helped the piano stay in tune. He said, oh, really? one of, yeah, oh. he said Arizona was one of the best places to own a piano because of the constant humidity level. Is that the case? Is there kind of a constant set point for humidity there? It's not as up and down as it is here? I'm very new here, but I think it's usually at like, and I could be mistaken, I think it's usually at like 20%. Okay. Or it could be lower. I know that uh, we had the monsoons. There's a monsoon season here, and before I left, we got some heavy rains. It's just insane. They come really heavy and the wind and you know, the rain just pours and then poof, it stops after like 45 minutes and the sun comes back out. But the humidity was about 49% then, so not too high, okay. but higher than it normally is. So it does stay pretty constant. It's, it's very low, but it does stay pretty constant, I believe. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, you owned... Uh, as you mentioned, you owned Nell Foster Designs in San Francisco for 18 years, and you were designing, installing, and maintaining residential landscapes. Mm-hmm. How? I mean, that's almost two decades. So how do you think landscaping has changed over that period of time? Well, I can speak in terms of California, because that's where I was doing all of my gardening, and there's such an awareness of the garden being part of your home. It's like your outdoor space is almost part of your indoor space. And I think people really got an awareness for more using native plants and plants that made more sense than just buying any old plant you see. And especially with the drought, there was, there's just been a very, again, I'm just speaking of, of, of California, but there is, there is just such a greater awareness of choosing plants in respect to the environment and to the lack of water, but I think that people, I think that people have gotten more adventurous with plants too, and with their landscapes. I think with um, being able to look at things online too, I think it's opened people up to more of a broader style of garden design, and they might look at something and say, "Oh, I really want that," but they wouldn't have thought of that themselves. Sure. Because there's so many resources online now for us to look at things, as you know. Yes. And do you think that there is a tendency to not appreciate the water demands of plants in these drought-stricken areas? Or are people more aware of what they've got to do to make things thrive there? The Bay Area, and I know in in Santa Barbara, for instance, had all these, these beautiful fountains. There's lots of fountains in Santa Barbara. And all of them, but like maybe one, have been turned off, and most of them have been planted with succulents. Really? But, um, and the parks, they let the lawns go brown. They stopped irrigating public spaces. I think there's a little bit more awareness there, but I was down in Southern California, down further, and like, you know, they've got their fountains on, and they're irrigating at noon, and so I think it just depends on where you where you are. I think the Bay Area is always very aware of, you know, of environmental issues. Yes, much more forward thinking than other areas. Exactly, exactly. In terms of that, but again, I grew up in New England where you didn't have to worry about water. 
Yeah. But I think people are, I know that annual color is not the big seller that it used to be and succulents are more in now too. So people are more aware of the water usage, I think. And here in Arizona, I haven't quite gotten a feel for it yet. Of course, there's so much desert landscaping that I'm not quite sure what's going on here with the water. Uh, I don't see too much. Like in California, you would, um, in Santa Barbara, for instance, there would be a little sign on the table if you went out to a restaurant. Only We only bring water if you ask for it. Okay. I'm not quite sure here. I've I've gray watered for a long time. Oh, I you keep have. a bucket in my kitchen sink and that's what I've done and that's how I water a lot of my container plants. So I've been very respectful of the water for years. So it's a different reality for folks in California than it is in other parts of the world. It is. You know, it's gonna be interesting how that played out because last year Northern California got it fair amount of rain, whereas Southern California did not, and that's where most things are grown. People are switching a lot to artificial lawns, and they're letting their lawns go brown, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens after this winter, because it takes like, it takes a few seasons to recover from a drought. Yes, it does. With the mastery level that you have, I'm so curious mm-hmm. to know, what garden is your all-time favorite? A place that you visited? Oh, that's not fair. Or created? <laughs> is there something that you're like, oh my gosh, this is one of my favorite places? Just off the bat, I would have to say my garden in Santa Barbara, because I spent a lot of time in it, and I really worked it to be what I wanted it to be. Now my garden in Tucson will be my garden, my favorite, favorite garden. But there's so many gardens I've been to I love. Some of the really traditional cottage gardens in England, and I love, I've been to Spain, I've been to a lot of different places. I love Sunnylands in Palm Springs, which is a very modern garden. It's a very artistic garden. It's a very yeah, different garden. I love that that garden. I love gardens with like a real sense of de- design and a lot of um, good use of plants, but it's just... And and I love like the gardens at Versailles. The mm. the, the color displays there are uh, amazing. So it's a, it's a hard choice. It would have to be have to be how I was feeling at the moment because I just love I love a lot of different styles of garden, and I think it's nice to be able to appreciate them all. And do you find for yourself as a gardener, are you very controlled, or do you let things get a little messy? What what's your style? My style is, you know, I would say that I, I'm i more controlled, but I'm not uptight about things. You know, also, too, where I've been gardening, it's not a while that things, things don't wildly grow like they would in the tropics. Okay. If you notice, the trees don't get quite as big. I mean, if there's leaves on my patio, I'm not going to freak out, but I like things. I like things. Fairly neat, and I like a lot of. Um, I wouldn't say I like order in the garden. I kind of like the garden to change a little bit. I would like, you know, move things around a little bit here and there. That's why I, that's why I like to use container plants actually in the garden because you can move them and switch them out easily. Kind of get the bones of your garden really, really down because, as you know, it takes shrubs and trees a while to grow in where it as the perennials and annuals can grow in in a season. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, you know, it's fun to be able to move move some things around and have a little change in your garden. Yes, it is. Let's chat a little bit about air plants. People are oh, are love loving them. air plants. And you wrote a post a while back about taking care of them. Are they hard to take care mm-hmm. of? And what are your tips for keeping them happy? Well, I will tell you, when I lived seven blocks away from the ocean and I grew them outside on my porch and I hardly had to do anything to them that they were easy to maintain. I'm in the desert now. It's a little bit more of a challenge, so I'm learning, but they're doing fine and they're outside. I'm going to need to bring them inside. Um, air plants like bright light, but not a lot of direct hot sun. So um, that's what one thing to know. And depending on your environment, like I have my air plants growing in a very shallow tray and I'll sprinkle them with water every morning just for that hum- humidity. Like just for now, you know, like right now the temperature is 103. Yes. So they like the heat, but they don't like the dryness because they're, 
native to the subtropics and the tropics and that area. So I try and increase the humidity that way. But they're all doing okay. And I found that the ones with a little thicker foliage are hardier than the ones with really fine, the smaller, fine, fine foliage. And do they need a lot of airflow? Yes. Yes, yeah. that's why they're called a air plants. They grow in trees. They grow up. Us. So when I see them in those glass globes, it makes me think, oh, don't keep them in there that long. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was they wondering. Grow, yeah. I, I don't know how that became so popular, but it's because they are air plants, and they do grow on. They actually grow on, like, telephone poles. They grow on other plants. They grow on rocks, so they need that air circulation. Okay. Well, that's a great tip. You know, I I ordered a, I literally ordered a box of them off of Amazon. So I I ordered this mm -hmm, box. mm -hmm. I got like 13 in this box. And the ones that you're talking about, the bigger, you know, fuller, thicker Mm -hmm. air plants did so much better. And some of them, the little, little bitty ones that looked like kind of like octopuses, (laughs) they were already toast by the time I got them. And so... I found that too. Yeah. I found that too. If you're growing in, you know, because we aligned ourselves with a, an air plant grower in the Santa Barbara area. So we sell their air plants on our website. And if they're in a greenhouse, it's a different story. But even I, in a very almost ideal, not really ideal, but idealer climate than would be growing in the house, I would have a hard time with those really fine ones. So um, you just... You spray them like every, again, depending on how dry you are, every couple days, a week might do it. But they do need some sort of moisture. I soak mine now in a pail every two weeks. Oh, you do? I would soak them for maybe like 15 minutes to half an hour. But that's kind of, that's okay. kind of, that's kind of nice because their roots get some, some moisture too. So I would say start with a few um, and experiment and... I am experimenting with it, with air plants now. Well, one thing that made me smile on your YouTube channel is your succulent wreath because I make a succulent wreath every year. Actually, I oh. take my succulent wreath down at the end of the season and I put it on the ground and then I bury it in mulch. And then uh, my hens and chicks and things that um, are perennial here in Minnesota do mm-hmm. come back. They actually grow a little bit oh, cool. while they're buried. But when I bring it out mm-hmm. in the spring, it needs a little refresh in spots. So when I saw you do your succulent wreath, it made me smile because I thought, oh, yeah, they're just the best, aren't they? They're fun to make. They're fun to make from cuttings. They're fun to make from plants. And there's different ways to there's different ways to do them. As you know, there's different frames and different methods of doing them. It's just what you what you feel comfortable with and what you learn, learn and what you want to experiment with. Now, do you propagate succulents a lot? I do. I propagate them a lot. I've got a lot, a lot of videos and info on that. I, I, I actually took a lot of cuttings from my garden in Santa Barbara and brought them to Arizona. So I did a video on that that I haven't posted yet. But okay, um, I, I propagate succulents, and mm-hmm. it's important that to have them a, kind of callous off, right? It, it is. It's called healing over. Yes. Healing over. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about that for people maybe who haven't tried it or know what it's about? Well, succulents are full of water. Their um, stems and their leaves are full of, of, of you know, water. So if um, you plant them right away after you do the cutting and you put them in the mix and then you water them, they might rot out. So it's best to cut them and heal them off. I um, heal them off depending on what the succulent is, anywhere from two days to six or six or nine months. There's some things, you know, because in, in Santa Barbara, I just had so, so, so many succulents that I had a box that I kept in my utility room and it was just full of succulents. And so some of them is healed off for a very long time. So it just depends on... Um, on the succulent, something like string of pearls, which is a very popular plant. It's got a really tiny stem. Yes. So that doesn't need to heal off very long at all. That's going to heal off in like two days, three days. But some of the aeoniums I would have healing off for a very, very long time. But And then I would always keep them dry for like a couple of days after I planted them before I gave them a good soak. 
But you do give them a good soak once they're healed off. And yes, then- and, it, and, and the thing is, if you're doing if you're doing cuttings, that's a little different. You don't want to like overwater them because you don't want you know this is a really fine old horticultural term. You don't want the stems to mush out, so you water them a little bit more moderately because they don't have the roots. I found. Okay. That's why clay pots are good for them, right? Something that's very breathable. Yeah. Yeah, clay pots are fine. I propagate it in all sorts of things. So I propagate it in tin cans and <laughs> all, all kinds of things. It's very important to use a very loose mix, like a succulent and cactus mix, so that they can root. Okay. All right. Well, those are some good tips. Now, I noticed in one of your videos, you're standing in front of this ginormous bougainvillea. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Yes, bougainvillea. Yeah, yeah. That was my bougainvillea glabra. <laughs> that had to be hard to leave behind. That thing was enormous. It was enormous. And Santa Barbara was a kind of climate where they just grew really well. At my new home, I've got four bougainvilleas. Um, and... They're not flowering. They aren't putting out quite as much of a display because, A, I haven't pruned them yet. It's been too hot. But it's cooler here. It's colder in Europe in the winter. So it takes them a little bit longer to get going where, as Santa Barbara, it's just that mild year-round climate. So they grow like crazy. It was always, always, always a challenge to prune them. (laughs) It's a challenge because they're so thorny or what? Well, it's a challenge because they're, they are very, they are very thorny and they're very vigorous growers. So you have to be, um, you have to be aggressive with it, especially when I did the one, I would do one pruning at the end of winter, which really set the tone of, of how the plant was going to grow. And that was a big, you know, a big pruning. And then you pinch them throughout the year and thin them because they're such vigorous growers and the pinching and encourages encourages more flowering and more color. So they sound so much like roses to me. Depends on the type of rose, but they grow a lot faster, of course, than roses, and they don't need as much water. They don't need, they aren't fussy as to fertilizing, but they do grow pretty fast. And roses do too. Roses are more deciduous and more dormant than a bougainvillea does, I think. But pruning them is much more involved than pruning a rose. When you think about your new garden, can you give mm-hmm. us a virtual tour of that? I know you mentioned you have a video of it on your website. I've got a video of it, and I've got some pictures on the blog. But you walk into a, a gate, and there's a patio that wraps around two sides of the house. And I'm at the edge of the desert, so there's a lot of desert landscaping on the other side. But my um, my garden is actually fairly green. There's... There is pyracantha, there's a fence post cactus, there's a pink grapefruit, there's plumbago, there's four bougainvilleas, there's um, lantana, there's um, there's a Carolina jessamine, there's star jasmine, there's a rose that I don't know what it is. It's a hybrid tea because it's just about to bloom again, and I, I, I don't know what it is. There's no tag and there's nothing there. There's a gardenia wow. of all things which is very strange because I would think it would be too dry. And I've got a windmill palm and just a lot of other plants too. I've got an area, the central garden in between the front door and the gate, there's a bed that I'm going to totally tear out. It's now a Ridgeron and Mexican salvia. Huh. And that's, I'm going to redo that. But there's a lot of, and then, as I said, there are, you know, the four moving bayas. <laughs> it sounds very lush for a desert garden. It, it is. If you look at the pictures, it is. Um, and, and the surrounding outside, just outside my fence, there's a pomegranate, there's a Texas olive, there is Desert Bird of Paradise, and there is a, um, I think it's called a desert bottle tree, and there's a few sorrel cactus, a prickly pear, so there's all, all kinds of things here. Are you a cactus lover? I love cactus. Yes, I do. You know, I've done cactus dish gardens, and I've done things with a cactus, but I think cactus have come into vogue in the past few years, too. I think they've been coming in, but I haven't had a lot of exposure to them, so this is something new, but I love cactus, and especially in this kind of a climate, they make sense, and there are some there are some interesting ones, and some of the euphorbias are beautiful, too. Hmm. 
like my fence post cactus is probably about probably about I think about sixteen feet tall. Wow. They're cool. So that's a show stuff. Um, yeah. I look forward to learning. I inherited a few pots. We did. You know, with, with cactus and some of the spines. Oh my goodness on these things. <laughs> Have you ever heard of clipping some of the thorns so that you don't get poked so bad? No, yeah. I haven't. I did a video on planting a dish garden, and with small small cactus, I've got a secret weapon for planting smaller ones. But when I I transplant these larger ones, my secret weapon is not going to work. So <laughs> I use pasta tongs. You do? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's clever. And you can see that on the video and the post, and it's really, you know, because even with gloves, those little spines will go in your hand, so that just gives you, you can hold the cactus, and you can plant it, and you've got the pasta tongs, so. Hmm. That's clever. Yeah, that, that, that's my secret weapon for planting smaller cactus, anyway. Yeah, won't work on the 16-footer. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it won't. I, I need sort of, sort of like, what are those things called, the Grip jaws, the things they use to pull a car out. Yeah, the jaws of life. <laughs> you need the jaws yeah, of life. Yeah, the for jaws some of these. life. That's it. <laughs> that's more the thing I brought. But I brought a few of my agaves too, and I brought a few of the cactus I had. So, and I brought my three a bit of ponytail palm and my hoya. You know, there's some plants I brought from. Oh gosh, don't you love hoyas? There, I love hoyas. Oh, I do too. I love them, and mine is doing. Surprisingly well. In Arizona, in the new home. In the new home, it's out oh, on my patio, and it's doing great. I was thinking it might be too dry, because Hoyas, even though they are considered a succulent, they like it a little bit more humid, I think. A bit and, more moisture, but it's doing great. And you have to protect so. it from direct sun, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's a bright light, but it's protected from sun, because it would burn in no time. Yes. I learned that the hard way when I took a Hoya out oh, and put yeah. it on my Don't deck. Oh, yeah. do you learn these things? <laughs> As oh. I said, gardening is about experimentation, right? Yes. Oh, it certainly is. Well, and you'll have lots to experiment with now. I will. I will. I've got all kinds of projects I want to do, and I made a list of videos I want to do, and it's about six pages long, so I'm like, oh, my gosh, am I ever, ever going to get all these done? Well, it's very invigorating <laughs> to move to a new space, especially with a garden like it this. It is. Yeah. It is, and as I said, it was hard to leave that garden behind. And people said, "Oh, how could you do it?" But now, the person, uh, you know, the person who bought the home really loves the garden. So you pass the garden on to somebody new. Yes. Well, and it gives you a chance to kind of express yourself in a new way, a new location. Exactly. It's going to stimulate personal growth for you as well. So your garden exactly. will reflect that. Exactly. It's going to be a lot. It gets you out of your comfort zone. That's for sure. What's really inspiring you in the garden right now, Nell? I mean, you've got this new space and lots of new energy around it. Is there something you're really eager to start? I think just everything is new to me. And even though I have a a lot of experience gardening and I studied gardening, like I went to a nursery a couple of weeks ago to go to um, a little class they were having on summer color for for the garden for desert garden so it's just I, I learned all these flowering plants that do great here and I bought some vinta and some pentas and I'm gonna plant them and um because the petunias that came with the house and the bowls all fried because I'm used to like petunias being a summer annual but here they're a winter annual. Oh. But I just think everything is inspiring and for me I'm a plant person so I really look forward to um, learning a lot of, of new plants. I think it, what's inspiring me now is that everything is just so new. And in my old garden, you know, with all this succulent, um, it was inspiring because I had a lot of colors and textures without using a lot of flowers. And I love, I also love art in the garden different types of things in the garden that are not plants. I brought quite a bit of my garden art with me, and then I'll be doing some more, too. I, I want to do mosaics because I've always, I've always wanted to do mosaics, and that'll be a, a nice way to bring color into the garden here that doesn't need to be watered. Well, and it's very so. fitting of a southwestern garden to do mosaics. I think so. 
so. I think so. And I, I like things in the garden other than plants. I just think it goes well together. Now, now, I mean, I'm not I'm not talking about having a gallery here, but just a few accent pieces. So sure. I love it. I do, too. I think it's fun to play with those things. And I call, you know, it's so funny because, you know, we always say, oh, I'm going to go out and work in the garden. But it's more like, I'm going to go out and play in the garden. What is one of your central strengths as a gardener? You've had a lifetime of experience in the garden, and you must know some of the things that you do so well that are effortless to you that are kind of mystifying to other people. What is one of your central strengths? Oh, I would say probably my most central strength as a gardener is my pruning abilities. I know we talked about that earlier, but I think that's it because I've always loved to prune. It's always been something that I have enjoyed doing because it's kind of like that. There was opposing forces of good and evil because you feel like you're being a little nasty, but you're actually being good. Yes. And you can create, I mean, you can shape a plant and you can really help a plant by doing the pruning, as you know. Yes. So that, I would say, is my central strength. So is that invigorating to you when you just see a hot mess of a plant and you're like, oh, I can totally redo this thing? Oh, yeah. Like I was up in the Bay Area. My client has a weeping pussy willow and it just grows like it. we call a cousin it. <laughs> and when I first look at it, I'm like, oh, my gosh. But then when I get in and I get under it and I get going and it's um, looking good, it is. It's very, it's very satisfying. Design is something else that so many gardeners struggle with. Yes. Does design come naturally to you, or do you have to work at it? I did it as a career for a, a long time, and I really, I really liked it. And I would work with landscape contractors too to do the hardscaping and bring the vision of uh, of the garden through. So, with my current garden, because it is smaller. It's going to be harder to do the design process because I want, you know, to do this and that. But that's actually what I wanted because this is a year-round gardening here, too. So I did not want to be a slave to the garden. So I would say that it comes natural to me because I really enjoy it. I love all aspects of design. I love to look at interiors. I love crafting. I love DIY. I love to look at a lot of different kinds of designs. So. I think it is just a fascination of mine, a hobby, and I made it a career. I did, as I said, I, I did Christmas decorating and flower shows, too. So those, those are different kinds of design. Now, what is something that you wish new gardeners knew? Um, that there are a lot of other plants that you can use other than the ones at Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> Not to knock. Home Depot, but there are such a variety of plants that you can use in different areas, and you don't have to use the same same plants. I think a lot of people are safe with that, too. Um, just, you see that, and I, I'm going to buy it, and that's what it's going to be, but um, I think it's good to broaden your horizons plant-wise, because there are a lot of interesting plants out there, and another thing is to know that plants are going to grow. So I think a lot of people plant things too, too close together or too far. So you really have to pay attention to the plant itself, as I said before, with the pruning. Well, when you think of your own personal growth as a gardener, what's something that you've learned in the past couple of years that you're applying more and more? Oh, I think I think patience. Just, just be patient with how things grow and it is going to t- take a while and just accept that your garden is not going to grow in in a heartbeat. Yeah. And uh, you can plant other things. You can plant annuals. You can plant things um, that are sort of like filler plants while your garden is growing. I think it's just, I think it's just patience. Yeah. And I've also learned to be more laid back because I was a professional gardener for so long. You you know, I was like a maniac gardener because I was doing it so much. But I've learned to be much more laid back about it. And I've always enjoyed it. So it's not like it wasn't, I wasn't enjoying it. But it, it was really, uh, when you're doing it full time, it's tiring. Yes. And now, and now it's just pure pleasure. That's but fantastic. I love being outside. I love nature. That's another thing I love. Too. So I love, I love being outdoors. 
So I'm curious, do you have any favorite garden bloggers or garden writers that you especially enjoy? Gardening is so specific regionally, and I think I'm so immersed in gardening now that I tend to look at more like food blogs. I look at design blogs. I look at crafting blogs. Probably one garden blog that I do look at at a regular basis just because I think it's got some cool stuff going on all over, you know, all over the country and the world is Gardenista. Yes. It's just a nice one to look at design-wise, and I like that. There are a lot of great garden bloggers out there, so many. I, I do, I do, you know, I do my garden blog and my YouTube channel as a profession. So I like to look at other things when I'm not doing this. Because as you know, you know, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about, well, what video am I going to do next? And what am I going to do? So, you know, I'm going to be growing some food again. So I'll probably look and see who's doing some food stuff growing online and look at that and see what's going on. But here I've, I've been talking to some other people at the farmer's market who grow things. And that's how I get my local information. Yeah, that's a great place to go to find out about edibles, that's for sure. Well, Nell, I want to thank you for your time today. It's been tremendous to get a chance to chat with you. Oh, you know, it's been so much fun, Jennifer. Thank you. And I'm so looking forward to seeing more about your garden space and what you're going to do in your new home and in your new garden. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to doing my garden, too, and seeing how it turns out. Because I'm going to do a video about planting my garden too, because my thoughts are kind of all over the place, and I thought if I do a video about it and I share some of my thoughts, it might help somebody else who's planting a garden. I think it's tremendous. You know, there people are very mobile, too, so it's not uncommon to yeah. have someone move, and then they find themselves in a zone that they're completely unfamiliar with. So Yeah. And, yeah. and some, people, some people are just interested in other gardening in other parts of the country and the desert is like I lived in California for so long that the desert is a really diff- different place to garden one thing I would be thinking about would be like snakes and, and lizards and such do you have to worry about that there are lots of lizards I, lo- I love them there's so many different kinds here the only one I've seen in my garden is a common king snake it's about a three foot long black black snake a gorgeous snake but when I garden in my beds, I, if I don't have a lot of thick vegetation, I, you know, I'll, know I'll take a bloom and I'll just make sure or, you know, there's no snakey poo in there. But snakes are good, too. I'm, I'm not crazy about rattlesnakes. I hope I don't see any of those. Yeah, I'm not crazy <laughs> about those either. That would, that would drive oh, me no. right out of my garden. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's too many around where I am. That's what I've heard. There are a lot of the common king snakes, and the common king snakes are constrictors who apparently kill the rattlesnakes. So I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. Oh, well, we'll keep those guys around. <laughs> but there's a lot of birds and bunnies and a ton of ton, ton of butterflies. That's why I got the pendants because they are a strong butterfly attractant. So I look forward to uh, seeing how the butterflies are going to discover and enjoy my pendants. <laughs> wow. Because we did get like four days of rain, you know, four cells of rain four days in a row, and then it just stopped. So the monsoon season apparently goes through mid-September, so we still have some time, I guess. But it's great. It's nice to see, you know, it's that sort of relief that the plants get. It's like, oh, my gosh, water, because it is hot here. Believe me, the sun is the sun here is so strong. <laughs> well, lots to adjust to and lots to learn and grow about there. Right, right, because I'm sort of the opposite of where you are, whereas you, we talked about it earlier, you garden in the, in, in the summer and it's almost a frantic time, whereas in the summer here it's almost too hot to do anything. I've got some ideas of how I'm going to prune, but I'm going to do it in the evenings or very early in the morning because it is too hot to be out there midday. <laughs> wow. Well, chronicle all of your learnings, even things like, uh, you know, the timing, how you plan to go out and when you go out and and how you handle yeah. it. I think those are all going to be great tips for people and they can learn alongside and you. Exactly. And I'm going to do a series called Pruning My Salvia for the First Time. And it's not like I'm pruning a salvia for the first time, but it's the salvia that I, that I inherited in this garden for the first time. And I think it'll really help people who maybe they've got some plants in their garden, but they don't know how to prune or they just moved into a garden and they don't know what to do. So 
Yeah. Um, I'm going to start that soon. So I've got my moving via here, so that's going to be a whole series. <laughs> oh, that'll be tremendous. Well, Nell, fun. I'm going to keep an eye on you and let me know if there's anything that you want to come back and cover. If that would be fun. I've got some ideas. We will definitely stay in touch. Yeah. I love the whole, uh, you know, adopting a new garden or, or creating it in a space that's already been started. I think that's a really great area to explore. It is good because so many people do that and they don't know what to do or they just, you know, satisfy for how the garden is. But there's so many other things that you can do. I think it's fun. I'm looking forward to it. And I want to say to you, good luck on your garden tour this weekend. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. Yes, I think it'll be a fun tour. It's only four hours. I think about a thousand people come through. So it's a lot of people in a short amount of time. But it should be hopefully really a good day. And then just timing-wise, the Garden Bloggers Fling is also this weekend, and it happens to be in Minneapolis this year. Thursday night, Friday, and Saturday, I'll be at this uh, Garden Bloggers Conference. We'll be touring a lot of private gardens. And then Sunday, yeah, Sunday was supposed to be a full day, and then we were going to be going into Wisconsin as well. But instead Mm -hmm. of joining them on Sunday, I'll come back and, and get ready. But I'll have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I won't be in the garden at all. Sunday morning, I figure I'll go out, I'll pull a few weeds, you know, primp a little bit out there, and then people show up at one o'clock and we'll call it a day. So I think it'll be lovely. And then Sunday by six, you'll be down in a bottle of wine. <laughs> uh, I, yes. Well, and then as as luck would have it, it's my daughter's birthday. So my daughter oh is my turning. Goodness. Yes. On Sunday, my daughter turns 15. So we will be celebrating. So my husband's going to take her and some friends bowling. And then to get some ice cream while the tour is going on. And then when they get back and the tour is all done, we're going to go get a nice big family supper somewhere and celebrate and eat, drink, and be merry, all that good stuff. So, Well, your next few days make me tired. Yes. I, we're going to be sleeping well next week, I have a feeling. so You you are. So enjoy our downtime. You know, that's one other thing that we need. As we get older, we really need our downtime. Oh, I hear you. Yes, absolutely. Downtime is good. (laughs) I think it's so important as we get older, too, to really take time for ourselves because our lives have just been so busy. Yep, that's right. we got to ramp up that self-care. So Exactly, exactly. All right. You know, it's been a joy to talk to you. Well, likewise, Nell. This was so fun. I will keep you informed about what's going on, and thank you. All right. Thanks, Nell. Okay, bye, Jennifer. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Well, that's it for the show today. I want to thank Nell Foster of the blog Joy Us Garden and her YouTube channel by the same name for being my guest. Wasn't that fun? And I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, David Myers, my editor, Ein Kadena, my copywriter, and my project manager, David Gregerson. And just a reminder that I'll have all the information that Nell shared on the show today over at my website, sixfootmama.com. That's the number six. F-T-M-A-M-A.com. My website is also the home of the Still Growing Podcast, and you can find all the episodes and all of the show notes right there. You can also have a quick shortcut to the Facebook group if you just head over to that website because I put it right up in the menu. So you just have to click there. It'll take you right to the Facebook group. Just go ahead, request to join. I'd love to see you in the Facebook group. Many thanks to the listeners who have volunteered to be part of the Listener Advisory Board. There's one position left. If you'd like to help the show out in that way, I'd love to hear your feedback and your insights for the show. Well, things are getting almost downright balmy this week in Minnesota. We've gotten a lot of sunshine and a lot of warm weather, and I know I'll be going out, taking Sunny on a walk and taking some pictures around the garden before things turn colder again. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.